Are we good to go? We uh, is that online? Yes, great. Well, I just wanted to say a very warm welcome to everybody who has joined us today, both in the room and online. Just a couple of housekeeping points. For those in the room, we are not expecting a fire alarm. So if the fire alarm does sound, please can you follow a uh, Commonics member of staff to the stairwell that is just beyond the lift and we'll assist you down. Um, please can you keep your phones on silent? This is being recorded, so um, you know, anything that you say, be conscious of that and you will be able to listen back afterwards. If you're joining us online, we really would like you to participate. We will be collecting questions and aggregating those that come in, so please uh, make use of the chat and, and get involved. So Friday uh, is International Literacy Day and in recognition of that we thought that we would gather together and talk about a subject that is very dear to our hearts at Kimonic, which is inclusive education. On the panel we have a, an esteemed um, group who are joining us both in person and online uh, and many of them reflect some of the Kimonic experience that we have both in Rwanda and in Syria Delivering, delivering inclusive education in quite difficult, difficult and different environments. Uh, our Rwanda programme, uh, USA funded uh, Samai Amanye, if I pronounced that correctly, um, which was really innovative in um, producing assessment techniques, which have gone on to be used across Rwanda. And we're going to talk specifically today about assessment. We're also going to talk about tools that can be used by teachers and leadership and Syria in particular is an education program which has enabled 600,000 children to access education both in schools, at home, after school education and we've done that by really focusing not just on the educational needs of the child but also on their psychosocial needs and protection and we're going to talk today about that. Those two programmes are very different environments and one of the things that we want to draw out is International Literacy Day. How can the learnings from different contexts be really taken on board and where do they differentiate and where actually would they apply universally? So to help me with that discussion, I'd like to introduce you to our panel. Um, first of all, we have Abdul Qadir Aledin, um, who is joining us from Turkey. He is our team lead on the Syria Education Programme and is also a monitoring, evaluation and learning expert and has a great deal of experience from across the Middle East in delivering these programmes. Um, next online we have Chantal Kebanda Dusabe, who is the technical lead for the um, African Centre for School um, Leadership at BBOB. Um, Chantal has more than two decades experience working in education and development and her current role promotes effective school leadership in Rwanda and beyond in Africa and we're going to talk specifically about how we support school leadership to enable um, inclusive leadership. Liz is joining us um, she is our senior vice president president of programs and has deep experience in conflict and transition settings in in Syria, in Yemen, in Nigeria and so she's really going to be able to talk to us today about how do you apply um, particularly safeguarding and well-being um, to, to children in um, conflict and resource restricted um, conditions. Martin is a visiting fellow at Fitter First Rand University, <laughs> you've got it, I've got, I haven't got it, you've got it, um, School of Education. Um, He's worked with Kimonics for the last 10 years and I mentioned assessment tools. Um, he developed the Legra assessment, which, um, which really showed that different techniques could be used to support children and far better outcomes were seen for learners than the traditional um, EGRA model. And, and so we're really going to delve a little bit more into how assessment can be a tool for teachers. Yanki is simply joining us today. Um, she's the Professor of English and Applied Linguistics at the University of Cambridge and a Fellow of the British Academy. Her recent work focuses on language um, and cognitive development in children in India. 
and she's going to talk specifically to us about the way in which uh, multi multilingualism affects children's ability to really access literacy and cognitive comprehension in learning. So a really broad range of, of experts and topics um, that we're going to discuss today. And I'm just going to start off by handing over to Abdul Kader to talk to us about tools and techniques that he has experience of that have really enabled teachers to be successful in inclusive education. Thank you, Louise. I hope you all can hear me okay. Great. Right. Um, uh, so, as Louise mentioned, when we are looking specifically uh, on the Syria education project, when we are looking at areas and contexts where the basic needs uh, are dependent on humanitarian assistance like the opposition controlled Northwest Syria, there are always challenges to consider when planning for intervention on a very big scale. Specifically, for example, the FCDO funded Syria education program uh, is the largest and the main uh, provider for education and education supporter in Northwest Syria. Uh, mainly the aim of this project is to uh, provide access to children to learn in safe and inclusive environment and improve their learning outcomes and well-being. Uh, usually we do this as a project. This project was up and running since the last five years. We provide intervention through uh, three main components. The first one is uh, access and system strengthening. The second one is safety and the third one is quality education. Uh, in access and system strengthening, we focus on providing equitable access to all children in Northwest Syria, uh, which cumulatively, as uh, Louise mentioned, supported over 600,000 children uh, since the start of the project, whose education had been impacted by the conflict. We're talking about children who have seen nothing white but war since 2011 because we support early grades. Uh, the second component is safety. We ensure the safety and accessibility of schools for every child. This is another crucial element we look at, involving measures to enhance school security, safeguarding, children well-being, etc. While as guaranteeing students' presence in school is not the sole objective and will not be enough, um, we need to make sure that quality that these children go through quality learning experience. So this was achieved by equipping teachers with comprehensive training, and this included enhancing their technical skills, capacity, competencies, along with the provision of teacher guides and other tools that I will be speaking on uh, shortly. All of these components were executed through an inclusive lens. So we're talking about access, safety, quality education, but also within using an inclusive lens through the project life, uh, life cycle. So uh, through the Syria education program, education and safe guide, uh, safeguarding practices have been implemented in over 50% of primary schools in Northwest Syria. That's why I said we were the biggest provider for education in the area, resulting in enhanced learning outcomes and increased resilience for approximately 600,000 children. By building the capacity of teachers within the very limited resources environment, uh, we significantly saw progress between mainly 2020 and 2022, which was evidenced by improvement in children well-being and improvement on children's ability in, um, in doing basic math and literacy score, improving their literacy scores as well. Uh, so, for example, as a remarkable outcome, 50% uh, of uh, Manahel students, the Syria Education Project students, entering grade three and grade four now fall within the top two categories of proficient and progressing readers, uh, as measured by the early grade reading and mathematics assessments. Even within the continuous conflict followed uh, by a massive earthquake in early 2023, the Syria Education Program managed to achieve 50% decline in children facing significant emotional and behavior, behavioral challenges. Uh, so, why I gave this introduction? Because it's most, uh, it's give you like the context we're talking about. Uh, but what I will focus now is on the tools. So the tools used uh, by the project included a variety of tools following mainly doing assessment, need prioritization for schools, teachers and children in the area, then conducting trainings for teachers, head teachers, other school staff. Also, we introduced some new positions to the schools in the area. Uh, 
then conducting learner learning circles, uh, conducting coaching and supervision, uh, mainly by lead instructors and instructors, educational instructors within the area, uh, providing support to the uh, education stakeholders. Uh, also, we provide a teacher guide to help teachers uh, implement and teach the curriculum. Uh, we distributed and developed literacy and numeracy booklets. Also, uh, we provided support to uh, by providing stipends to over 5,000 teachers on an annual basis. In addition to that, specifically in an area that uh, inclusive education was not really common and it was not a priority uh, to the Syria uh, Syrian regime prior to the conflict. We're talking about 2011 and uh, prior to that. The it was really essential to have identification tools uh, to help teachers identify learners in need for further support. So we had a variety of tools as well on that front, mainly the learning assessment to identify children who need further support. Uh, so we do continuous learning assessment. Uh, the Washington Group Child Function Screening to identify learners with disabilities and also the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire which help us identify children who need psychosocial support. Uh, so training uh, teachers. Yeah, you've only got one more minute. Would you yeah, like yeah. something? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so training teachers and school staff on these tools have helped an inclusive intervention in an area with high needs. Uh, uh, so mainly training teachers after they identify the learners who need the support, for example, uh, that uh, we train them also on alternative education plans to teach children with disabilities. And then uh, we also established over 34 special education centers to support over 250 children with severe disability. So to, to conclude with the main achievement from this project, the Syria education program has uh, supported children with formal education and also provided payment to teachers with all of these tools and support needed and at a cost which is less than two pounds per child per month. Uh, thank you. Over to you, Louise. Thank you so much for that summary. I, I have to say, having recently visited um, the team, I was absolutely blown away by what they've managed to achieve in such difficult circumstances. And, and it struck me that there were learnings from that that you could apply to, to, to any context. Um, I think a, a key point that, that was raised there was really assessing the children that had additional needs and making sure that those were responded to and there was provision for response. Um, I didn't mention in the introduction, but Liz actually has also been the team lead of this programme. Um, and Liz, I wanted to ask you specifically about providing that uh, psychosocial support and ensuring that the children were adequately safeguarded and how that was done in an environment where there were some um, found trauma informed approaches to children. Absolutely. I apologize. I need to check. Is my mic working? Okay, good. I almost forgot. No, thanks, Louise. I appreciate that question. I think it's something that's quite close to my heart in terms of the work that's been done in Syria and also the way that it's built on previous work that, that we carried out. Um, with USAID funding and also formal with DFID funding um, in Democratic Republic of Congo that really spoke to how you engage with and provide um, students with the platform of safety um, that they need when they've been traumatized. And I think you know one of the greatest um, challenges and responsibilities of undertaking education programming when you're working in a fragile and conflict affected state or situation is that safeguarding imperative for the education program because you are working with children and need to ensure that we're really focused on ensuring sexual, physical, social, emotional safety for the children in the classroom um, when there's so much going on in the broader context that's challenged for those things. And I think the important thing to remember for education programming is not only is safeguarding and support to the psychological well-being of the children an ethical requirement um, for us as we're engaging. It's also a critical technical intervention because evidence has shown time and again that if you are not, if a child is not feeling safe, they are not able to learn as a necessary prerequisite for learning to happen. We've seen a lot of evidence come out over the last 10 to 20 years showing 
that the more safe children feel, the better the literacy scores are, the better the mathematics scores are. Um, and there's one study back in 2015 that actually tried to quantify what's the learning loss of not feeling safe. And it specifically looked at children who were bullied and said that's equivalent for primary age children to the loss of a year of education. So not only is it an ethical requirement for us, mandatory to what we're doing, but it's also a really important technical intervention in terms of setting the groundwork so that children are in a place of position so that they can learn. And I think that becomes even more critical when you're working in fragile and conflict affected environments because the very nature of the power dynamics have played within any culture that frequently disadvantage girls that disadvantage um, particular groups, whether individuals with disabilities, whether ethnic minority or ethnic, religious or other minorities, those populations, just as everyone else does, becomes even more uh, more at risk in these uh, at cast environments. And because of this, we've got to really put in place a framework that supports those, those most vulnerable. And when you take a look at formal education in particular, which is where we worked in both Syria and in DRC, um, you have these very natural power relationships within schools. Um, where you frequently have both a male dominated power hierarchy and a hierarchy coming down from the EU level to the teachers, to the poor children who are at the bottom of that um, hierarchy and, and quite disempowered in many cases. And so I think a critical piece of the work we do is, is how to empower them and how to support them, as Louise was referencing. Um, and I think that the conundrum of providing safeguarding in an education environment is made. Um, even more important by the fact that evidence has also shown um, that education can be a preventative or a safety factor in conflicts when you can provide a safe education environment that provides prevention and helps to stabilize children and protect them from some of the worst um, abuses and, and uh, effects of being in a fragile conflict environment, we've seen that children who are out of school due to conflict are often more susceptible to um, sexual abuse, to child trafficking, to recruitment into armed groups. So the question and the challenge for us in this field is knowing that safeguarding and psychological support is imperative for um, children to learn, knowing that schools can provide that, but they can also be a place in which harm occurs, how do we set up systems that allow for and support those children. I think there's been a great deal of research globally uh, that speaks to how you set up safeguarding systems, how you deliver psycho psychosocial support. I won't speak to all of this, but I think what we've learned both in Syria and in Congo has been that what's really critical is to recognize that these are issues that are taking place within a much broader social fabric and context within the school, within the community, within the culture at play. And so where we found our greatest success is when we've been able to layer different of these toolbox of interventions in coordination with system strengthening approaches to really work through systems change at all levels within the education sector, all the way down you know, to the classroom teacher and out to the communities. And I think that's the second big principle is how we engage with communities and make sure that we're bringing them along in building out the principles of safeguarding, building an understanding of buy-in for supporting children's psychological needs. And I think, you know, the evidence um, that we've seen out of both Congo and Syria has been that when you do have a multifaceted program that engages in building systems and working within the existing structures, capacitating them and changing the attitudes towards safeguarding, and mental health and psychosocial issues, you're able to see change. We saw in Syria um, an increase by, to, of about 64% in the number of teachers who reported and supported safeguarding concerns in classrooms. Um, and I think when we looked at the work that we have done in Congo, we spent a lot of time setting up thousands across, across the massive country of um, parents, and community groups focused on safeguarding and holding schools to account with weekly meetings with school leadership, discussing challenges of violence, reducing violence, measuring um, what had been done in schools to reduce violence. We used a very similar approach 
in Syria on the program that Abdul Qadir was just speaking about, of really engaging the communities. And I think particularly in the Syrian context, this was important because safeguarding could easily have been perceived as an outside idea or concept being imposed um, from the West. And that volatile environment in which designated terrorist um, organizations are operating, it would be easy to leverage that against the programming um, that we were doing. Um, and so getting the buy-in of the communities and really working from the ground up to change attitudes towards safeguarding and issues like corporal punishment, I think was critical to affecting the change that we've seen, the support and the accountability that communities are taking for these issues. Um, so that was a, a quick overview and hopefully making the case yes, for yeah, safeguarding. Fabulous, please. And again, I think what really struck me hearing you talk there was the importance of giving parents and caregivers a voice in how their children are educated and, and often they are um, marginalised and have experienced trauma and by having um, education directorates and leadership coming down and dictating to them how their children will be educated, particularly if they have um, additional educational needs or are struggling, um, I think can then um, just consolidate the trauma that they've experienced. Um, I wanted to hand over now to Chantal and really talk about how can we support uh, leadership of schools to engage with inclusive education and engage with uh, working with parents and caregivers to ensure that it's successful. Thank you, Luisa. Um, good morning from uh, Kigali. I would like to thank Kemonics for organizing this event and for giving me the opportunity to share some insight on VVOB's approach to inclusive education, including the role of school leaders as gatekeepers and change of um, change agent at school level. I will introduce VVOB um, as an international organization committed to realizing quality education for all learners without um, discrimination. To achieve this ambition, VVOB focuses on strengthening professional development systems for teachers and school leaders. And VVOB's approach is to work closely with government in co-creation and co-implementation of initiatives based on the needs and the context of the countries. We believe and invest in long-term engagement with governments to ensure sustainability and, uh, and scalability of our initiatives. Coming back to uh, our approach to inclusive education, what works is First of all, about changing beliefs about what is inclusive education. We support teachers and school leaders to change their mindset about what inclusive education is all about. Not to focus on special needs as a separate issue, but rather consider inclusive education with uh, which is broader than special needs education. Teachers and school leaders are supposed are supported to, to treat all learners, including learners with disabilities, as individuals, and to make sure that all learners can learn. Uh, I'll give examples from South Africa, Vietnam, and Rwanda. In South Africa, what we did was to work closely with the government partners on establishing practices of differentiation in every lesson. This is basically about adapting every lesson to meet individual needs of learners. This approach is based on the idea that students learn best when they are engaged, challenged, and supported according to their individual differences. In, in Vietnam, what uh, we did is professional development or preschools teachers on child monitoring and inclusion to help them observe, assess and, uh, the well-being and involvement of preschool children um, using what we call process-oriented child monitoring. And this process helps teachers to see individual needs for um, children and adjust their classroom practices accordingly. And for all these approaches in uh, South Africa, Vietnam, and Rwanda, we stimulate collaborative and reflective learning among teachers and school leaders 
to help them learn from and with each other based on reflection and um, actual research. Another important point I want to make is um, is that we want to uh, is to recognize the role of school leaders as gatekeepers of any change happening at school level. As such, we involve school leaders in every intervention targeting teachers uh, because effective school leaders create conditions for effective implementation of any innovation in their schools. And this is why in Vietnam, based on the, uh, beside the professional development on child monitoring and inclusion, school leaders are provided with an additional CPD on effective school leadership, focusing on promoting inclusive schools and classrooms. And in South Africa, we have online courses and toolkit on gender transformative pedagogy in ECE, which includes a component for school leaders to promote them uh, to provide them with tools and resources to uh, promote gender quality, equality for young children at their schools and prevent gender-based violence. We have resources available, the materials are available and are being used at scale by the government department. In Rwanda, um, uh, in Rwanda, what we do is uh, quite uh, slightly different we our entry point is strengthening effective school leadership uh, we target directly school leaders so together with the government uh, of rwanda partners we developed and we are co-implementing a course on effective school leadership to support school leaders perform against the approved professional standards uh, of effective school leadership these standards are five in total and the course is aligned with these standards. Um, they include setting strategic direction for the school, leading learning, leading teaching, managing the school as an organization, working with parents in the wider community. And inclusion is considered as a cross-cutting thing addressed throughout uh, the standards, all the standards. And we have case studies and activities on gender and inclusive education in our modules, which helps school leaders to be exposed to and uh, reflect on different beliefs and practices about inclusive education. And this gives them insight on how to cater for all learners and therefore intentionally address social and in social inclusion aspects in their schools, which are in many cases under-resourced within their limited resources. I'll stop here and I want to thank everyone for kind attention. Thank you. Back to you, Liz. Thank you, Chantal. Perfect timekeeping, by the way. So thank you for that. Um, Chantal finished off there talking about Rwanda and specific interventions uh, with leadership in, in, in Rwanda. And I really want to hand over to you, Martin, to talk about your experiences of assessments and how they can really be used as a tool to assist teachers. Sure, thanks very much. Do you need the mic or can I manage it? No, I think you're fine. Yeah, OK. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to give you the backstory to um, LEGRA, which Louise touched on a moment ago, um, which is local early grade reading assessment. Um, it was introduced by Kamonix Project Somromenia in Rwanda, so we're continuing the Rwanda theme. Um, why did we go this route? Let me talk, let me tell you the story. Basically, um, let's start by saying the normal ways of um, assessing learners um, don't cater generally for vulnerable learners. It's as simple as that. Um, but for vulnerable learners to remain in school, they need to be able to read. They need to be able to prove they can read. In other words, it's not just a matter of being able to read, they need to be able to do the assessments to show that they can read. And rarely do we cater for such learners within those processes. So they need to be able to read. Traditional ways then of assessing learners don't cater um, for learners with the various um, disabilities or learning challenges that many of our learners face. Unfortunately, what often happens, and this is across the world, teachers tend to reinforce that process because learners bring down the learners with such challenges tend to bring down their overall scores 
um, teachers are judged to some extent by how well um, the class is doing in assessments. So the tendency is to push learners out. If they can't read, they're much more likely to drop out anyway. We know that. Um, or to be internally excluded. Either way, they're not learning. Um, so let's talk about the various um, existing um, learning assessment processes that we found in Rwanda already. There was continuous assessment. The problem with continuous assessment is that the teachers were using it in a way that didn't allow them to use the data um, to remediate and to identify learners who were zero scorers. In other words, learners who were non-readers. Um, this is partly because uh, continuous assessment tends to be non-standardized um, and it tends to be teacher driven on her own. She develops the test basically. Um, the other um, tests that were used were the um, early grade reading assessment, EGRA, which is used broadly across the world. Um, it is high stakes, whereas continuous assessment is low stakes. By high stakes, um, and let's be honest, EGRA is hugely high stakes because it feeds in, for most countries, it feeds into their um, learning um, and educational aspect of their human capital index. You don't get much higher stakes than that. Um, but let's talk about EGRA. Um, at the beginning, I did a lot of EGRA, led a lot of EGRA in South Sudan, uh, Uganda, and a number of other countries. And at the beginning, I must admit, I, I liked it. it. It seemed to be sample based, it's national, uh, it seemed to produce valid results. And then I began to be somewhat worried, and Rwanda made me increasingly worried. Why was I worried? Well, firstly, let's just talk about how EGRA is done. It's conducted by external enumerators. In many countries, these are young men. They're urban young men going to schools. What they do when they get to the school, they pull the learners out through a process that learners, I promise you, don't really understand. It's statistically fine, um, but kids who are six and seven don't normally understand statistically fine. Um, so you pull the learners out. You then sit the learner one on one with an enumerator, a stranger, and you tell them it's a game. Now, most learners understand by the age of six and seven and eight what a game is. And the one game they're told by their parents never to play is the one where they sit with a stranger. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a problem straight away, in my view, with the way that early grade reading assessment is undertaken. On top of that, the assessor is using a tablet, which for most rural learners is a strange instrument. They don't quite understand what's going on. Um, and the enumerator is following a script. They are informed in the training very clearly that they cannot um, move away from the script. They can't console the learner if the learner starts crying or shows stress. Um, and as a result, what tends to happen, because teachers understand that this is stressful for learners, so therefore vulnerable learners, in my experience, tend to be kept out of school or kept out of the way when EGRA is conducted in their school. It's obvious teachers are protecting the learners. The problem is that means we don't, they're never actually tested, which is probably a good thing because it would be a horrible experience for them. Um, so we have this test, which I began to think, I'm sure this is not testing learners at their true ability. Um, and so with some Romania, we then began to explore options. So we looked at the um, RTI at the time was testing um, GALA, which is Group Administrated group administered Learner Assessment. And it was doing this in a number of countries in Africa. This is basically means that the, you, do, you test a group, so it's paper-based. Um, you have an enumerator at the front who goes through a number of things they put on the board, et cetera, et cetera. And the kids largely um, using a sort of multiple choice type approach. It has been proven that it is reliable um, and it is a fairly good predictor of how they're going to perform later. So we were interested in Gala. Um, it's less intimidating because it looks much more like the way they're normally tested in school. Um, but it's still sample based and it's still using an enumerator who may have an accent and a, a, a language use that the kids are not familiar with. What we wanted, though, was valid, reliable data that the teachers could use 
to inform their teaching, identify zero scorers, and could use for the basis for remediation. Also, we wanted to set national benchmarks because Rwanda, every time there was a test, new benchmarks were put in place. So EGRA had been tested against a whole range of different um, uh, benchmarks. Um, so we went through a modified Angoff method to set national uh, benchmarks and cut scores. Just to give you a minute, we've got two minutes left. Don't do that, don't do that to me. <laughs> um, we used the gala idea and we trained teachers across um, piloted and then across the whole country to implement um, this approach. Um, we borrowed pre and post assessment meetings from the community development school performance review. What this means is before they assess, they sit down as a group, uh, a learning circle with the principal um, leading the discussion and they predict how their learners are going to do. Then they do the assessment the next day. Then the following day they do a post assessment when they look at what what gaps emerged. Why did they predict differently from what actually happened? in this in the in the um, testing um, in this process of piloting um, the Rwanda Education Board insisted that we should add um, not just group administered um, tests but they wanted us to do um, learner fluency which means that the learners have to read the text one-on-one -on -one with their teacher and they also have to do reading comprehension we accepted that and it's worked well okay is Legra then a solution to early grade reading assessment. The majority of subtests were adapted for the group assessment with fluency and comprehension, as I just said, added. After piloting, LEGRA was then written into the national assessment protocol. So it's now a national process. This is the dream, to be honest, when you're doing anything like this. The government immediately picks it up and puts it into policy. It doesn't happen often. Um, every early grade learner in Rwanda, every term is now tested using the LEGRA methodology in Kenya, Rwanda. Uh, the teachers use the results to identify learners with challenges and they remediate. And the analysis found that LEGRA, uh, JJ, if we can have the slide up. Um, it is already, okay. Um, trend analysis found that LEGRA results broadly track LEGRA results. And if we look at the data, um, and this is the very simplest data. Um, I haven't really finished, Louise, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's, it's so interesting. I've lost track of time. That's good. <laughs> um, if we look at the bottom, um, am I allowed to move around? Of course you are, please. Thank you. Okay, if we look at this, we see that, and zero scores is absolutely critical because this is the number of kids who can't read. You would expect the number of kids who can't read to be consistent across testing. Because if you can't read, you can't read, you can't read. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter what the testing process is. And we find that with EGRA and with LEGRA, it's fairly consistent. It's 5.2% of learners as against 5.6% of learners. Oddly enough, LEGRA actually produces a higher percentage of learners unable to read, which we found really interesting. The important thing is though, statistically, it's an insignificant difference. This is a, this is a hugely statistically significant difference. So basically what we found, and this was undertaken by USAID, they did an equating study um, independently of Summer Amenia, after Summer Amenia had actually finished um, delivery. Um, they found that the average number of words using LEGRA that the learners could read was around 46. And the average number they could use with EGRA was 27. That's a massive difference. LARS, which is the national exam which uses most of the EGRA type uh, methodology, was somewhere in between. Why is this? The equating study, by the way, was done with 460 odd learners across the country. Um, it was a sampling process, but what they did was they used the same methodology as, um, so, that, so for instance, for the LEGRA part, they used teachers doing the testing of their own learners in the classroom. For the EGRA, they used enumerators, et cetera, et cetera. So they tried to replicate as close as possible what was normal with the different approaches. So why do the learners do so much better under LEGRA? Let's just run through that and I finish on this. That point. you say, that's your last book. It is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, firstly, I would argue they feel comfortable being tested by their own teacher. It's, let's be obvious, it's got a lot of 
if you've got your teacher and you understand her accent and you're used to her and what I've seen happen is that when a learner gets stressed and learners will get stressed and we're finding in um, where we're beginning to implement something very similar in Syria, northwest Syria, the learners get very stressed very often. And what will happen in that situation is the teacher will put her arm around the learner or whatever. An enumerator can't do that because there are all sorts of protocols that bar a stranger for putting an arm around the learner, obviously. So the enumerator can't console a learner who's stressed. Most early grade teachers are female. That's another important difference. The learners understand the teacher's accent. The subtests being done by group process is much more similar to the way that um, normal testing in the classroom works. So it's a more familiar methodology. The one on one may be not so familiar, but it's not hugely different because it's now the teacher. In many classes, the kids come up with the fund anyway and read to the teacher um, on and on, on and off. Perhaps most important, learners aren't confused about what's going on. They're not put in front of a stranger suddenly without really any understanding of what's happening. And let's be honest, reading is a very complex task. We assume it's an easy process. We tend to assume it's an easy process. But when you're just learning to read, it's incredibly complex and it's scary. And now you're being asked to do this in front of a stranger with EGRA. It's not that surprising that with EGRA, the learners do much worse than when they have their own teacher in front of them. There are various other advantages as well. Um, teachers may be more lenient. That's another reason why we may be getting better results. But does it matter? Does it really matter? What we did find is there was no consistent cheating across the country. So we saw trends which we expected to see. We found that districts which did better with EGRA did better with LEGRA. We found that rural learners generally did worse in LEGRA and in EGRA. It's exactly what we would expect. Kids in Kigali, the capital, did better than anywhere else. It's what we would expect. So the trend was exact, exactly what we would have expected across the country. Why am I talking about this when we're talking about inclusion? Because what we then saw was that because it's now full population assessment, every learner was included. And we saw some wonderful examples of teachers looking after, bringing the kids who had poor um, who had um, um, sight impairment and hearing impairment to the front of the class when they were doing the assessment, <laughs> catering for them when they did the uh, assessment one on one, um, making sure that there was Braille um, available where necessary, making sure that the conditions were available for kids with levels of disability. We've now got, I believe, the basis to make sure I go back to my original point that these kids have a fair chance of being able to prove that they can read, which I would argue with EGRA they never had. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. What a fabulous achievement to have uh, created a space for all children to be able to have access and support from their teachers. So well done. That's happy. Um, Martin, you talked about the success being partly because the teachers have the same accent as the child, they're known to the child um, and I really want to use that as a segue to talk to Yanthi about how difficult it can be for children to develop literacy and comprehension when they are learning in a language which is not their mother tongue. Yanthi. Thank you very much and hello everyone. Um, so well I think it's uh, uh, something that uh, shared knowledge that when you want to learn in school whatever subject you want to learn, you need language, OK? So whether it is mathematics, science, technology, language or essay based, as we call them, subjects like geography and history, you do require a certain language ability, level of language ability to understand the textbook, not just read it aloud, but be able to comprehend what is included in terms of information, and to be able to perform in assessments and exams, as we've just heard. But it's also a matter of understanding not just what is said, but what is inferred from what is said, right? So you need to have some critical skills 
and these critical skills trivially presuppose a certain level of language knowledge. Okay. So I think that this can show to everyone that what we want from children across the world is not only to be able to read them out and decode, as we call it, but also to be able to comprehend what they're reading and bring the knowledge from different subjects together to develop their critical learning skills. So I think for, for that to happen, the question of the choice of language of education is at the center. OK, and it is at the heart of accessibility of knowledge, uh, skills, but also learning outcomes. Now, um, we always say that, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward in this country, which has a monolingual, well, it's supposed to be a monolingual society, at least officially, uh, but obviously we know it isn't. But there are other societies which are officially multilingual. OK, one of the, I mean, there are many of those. Um, but in these societies, the question of language of education is very central. So you have multilingual learners growing up in multilingual societies, particularly those with colonial history. OK, where it's not just the vernacular and the regional languages, but it's also languages that they've inherited from their history, right? So like English or French, for example. And for these multilingual learners, they need to both acquire and comprehend the school subject content in languages they know and they can do that, no problem. The fact that they are multilingual doesn't create a problem for them. But when they are trying to learn at the same time a new language and the subject content, that's when we find that there is a big problem with learning outcomes. Okay, and this is where governments, policymakers have to make a decision about what is going to help learning outcomes rather than uh, drive the decision on the basis of political will. Okay, uh, this is a, a particular problem for children growing up in underprivileged environments, okay, or children with disability. Um, and for children with, who are neurotypical, but they grow up in underprivileged context, for these children, there's usually little home literacy support and the school resources are poor. OK, so we need to put that in perspective and imagine a country like India where um, there is a very large number of, of children who are in these underprivileged contexts and they go to uh, government schools where the resources might might be poor, particularly when the official medium of instruction is English. So um, we ran a project in uh, three different sites of India. Uh, we tested directly and individually 2,500 primary school children in years four and five of primary school. Uh, that project was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council and the then called Department for International Development, now MCDO. And we assessed um, the oral language skills, the written language skills, and the problem solving skills with uh, mathematics word problems. And what we found was that the major problem children faced in school was reading for meaning. So they could read aloud in different languages, but they weren't able to access uh, comprehension there. And that was particularly obvious when the medium of instruction was English. Um, and I should say here that the problem of comprehension was not language comprehension in general, because when these children were tested in English orally, so listening comprehension, they were much better than with uh, reading comprehension. So um, this is because multilingualism in these individuals, um, both children and adults in India, is mostly an oral competence. It doesn't translate into literacy in multiple languages. So we should take advantage of that. We should understand that they are better language learners than many other uh, individuals in the world who grow up in monolingual societies. Within this context, we found particular disadvantages for minority language speakers and marginalized learners, uh, particularly in English medium of instruction schools. So thank you for, for, for the slide. So what we've done as a response to that with follow-up projects is that we developed and piloted a multilingually resourced intervention program 
for improving reading comprehension in government school learners in Hyderabad. At the moment, we are restricted to Hyderabad, uh, but uh, we are collaborating now with uh, the Cambridge uh, Part International Partnership for Education, um, which uh, so together we are going to extend that uh, to other states of India using other languages because at the moment we've used uh, English and Telugu. So uh, we did this. I mean, this is just an outline of the intervention, uh, which had three phases. Um, in each of the phases, the children, the learners in the classroom were assessed directly on a one to one basis on a number of tasks, but the crucial point was reading comprehension. Uh, but the intervention also included teacher training. So we trained the teachers of these children uh, in the classroom to use Telugu and other languages that would be helpful for the children to access and understand what the English text was saying. OK, and the texts were from the textbook. So if we can move to the next slide. Thank you. So I'll just give you um, an example. And this is from environmental science, so it's not uh, from an English language uh, textbook. So uh, what we did is we took the text from the textbook. Not all texts are equally good or not all textbooks are very good, but we did what we could with with what we had uh, in front of us. And what we did is at different points of the text, we used Telugu not only to translate, but to encourage children in peer group discussions to talk about the different concepts that were involved, right? And so we had the text in English, the, the teacher would read aloud in English, but then reformulate in Telugu or Hindi, depending on what the children could access. And crucially, something that was not there in the government schools that we looked at was we encouraged peer group discussion in any language among the children. Okay. So if we just move to the last slide. Um, so we had in total, we started with uh, 317 children from Hyderabad schools. We gave an advantage to the control group uh, that was not presented with the intervention program. Control group was from a low cost private from low cost private schools. And as you probably know, low cost private schools offer English medium instruction. And we compared these children who didn't have the intervention to the children from government schools, also from English medium instruction schools. And so I hope you can actually see from the three phases of the intervention, the progress that each group uh, made. Um, the intervention group, the government school children, uh, started off lower than the um, uh, than the uh, control group from the private school, but eventually the difference between them was not significant. It was across a period of seven months, um, and I have to say that the most important outcome. I mean, these are just quantitative uh, answers, but. The most important uh, outcome is that both teacher and learners mental health and well-being in the classroom was much better when other languages were used and everybody felt more comfortable using these multilingual resources. So hopefully in the next three years we will be able to expand this intervention program to other languages and other states in India where uh, we will get more results because this is just obviously uh, preliminary results. So, thank you so much. For that. You know, that's absolutely fascinating. I, I, I said to you before the session that I worked on a program in Ghana, a competence basic education program, and that had very similar results in that when children were to, a, able to access initial literacy in their mother tongue, yep. their ability to then go on and 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 be literate in in English and other languages was just fast accelerated. Um, I feel that we've gone full circle from talking about um, assessments to the underlying importance of um, children feeling safe and secure in their environment and that really enabling them to, to be successful educationally. So it's at that juncture that we're going to open it up to any questions in the room or online for our panellists. Great, um, we've got a roving mic. Super. Luis, yeah.
I've actually got a thousand questions. So I'll just start with them. Um, first, just a thank you to all, everybody because it was all absolutely fascinating. So I thoroughly enjoyed my morning. Um, my question could, you, sorry, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. I'm Dr. Amelia Roberts. I'm the Deputy Director of UCL Centre for Inclusive Education and Inviting Enterprise for the INA. So this is right up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I. The, the work you were talking about with the group work and the multilingual opportunity was fascinating. I worked in Hong Kong, did some teaching in the um, Academy for Performing Arts, and my students fell asleep. So within about a day, I realised that I needed to set them group work so they could do the group work in terms of music work much better. So that spoke very much to me personally. My question is, would you augment what you're doing with more higher order thinking skills activities? So the example you gave of the beehive was great. I just wanted to go a step further with more predictive questions, for example, what might happen well, with the bees in the winter, when there's less flowers, and whether you would add that to the resources so you get the, the wonderful cognitive distance to engage in learning and the increased use of vocabulary and language. Thank you very much for, for your question. Um, absolutely, yes. So what we're doing now, I didn't have time. I was <laughs> under strict orders, you know, to, to stop at six minutes. So, um, but what two of the projects that we currently have after the intervention are on assessments. And uh, these assessments are both summative and formative assessments. So what we are doing is using multilingual resources to test not only factual information that is accessed through the text, but also inferential uh, questions. And we are using two genres. So one is the narrative, which is usually what you find in English language textbooks, and the other is the expository text where, and I didn't mention the narrative because the narrative was much better across children from the beginning. Although the questions were inferential and that they were about, you know, the mental states of characters and so on and so forth. Uh, and children were very good at this. So it was the expository that started lower and where we saw the big improvement. And it seems to us that the expository texts are the ones that the school is responsible for exclusively because it's academic language, it's school language. So children have to learn how to think in a more critical way with facts and so on. And so, yes, we are using this. Um, the results from the uh, classroom assessment that we are doing will be with us next week. <laughs> um, but uh, we are also doing a dynamic assessment with individual children because we want to capture children with disabilities uh, and we want to see how much language plus, you know, prompting uh, children with the mother tongue would actually improve their inferential understanding uh, of the text. But yes, what 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 we had in the peer group discussion was very much including uh, inferential questions and thinking. Well, I'm not sure they were, whether they were exactly predictive, but they were what the child's opinion was on the basis of the facts about you know the beehive and you know what would happen in this uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, difficult situation or whatever. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have a, a question over here and then here. Yeah. Hi, uh, yeah. Thank you again. Uh, it's really, really interesting to learn from you all. Uh, my name is Lisa Sanya from Social Work and Direct. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay. But um, well, the first question was more around um, how we have on the programs or in uh, the research you engage with uh, organisations with uh, people with disabilities. Um, and I say this because on our playing program in Nigeria, um, our, our partner site savers they created an action plan on how to engage with organisations with people with disabilities, which has been really helpful in uh, making sure that that, that relationship is uh, really, really strong. Um, and then the second question was around um, with maybe working with uh, organisations with people with disabilities. How have you ensured that you met the hard to reach children, particularly those with psychosocial disabilities, not just uh, children with physical disabilities? Um, and then how have you adopted safeguarding mechanisms uh, for children with disabilities, particularly those with psychosocial disabilities? So, big questions. <laughs> yeah, big questions. I think we'll, we'll hand that over initially to Abdul Kader, um, and then and then it'd be great for you to get a response from yourself. 
Thank you, Luis. Um, unfortunately, when when the voice is coming from the room is not really clear, but I think uh, the question was focused on um, how we engage uh, other organization working with children with disabilities, right? Yeah. 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 No, yeah, that's that's a very good question. Actually, it's it's like one of the main points that we rely on in terms of using the existence existing resources uh, to provide value for money intervention because we don't rely only on the uh, FCDO fund, for example, uh, using our downstream partners and our uh, uh, our main stakeholders within the community, but also we rely on other resources. Like, for example, we have a very well known um, organization that work with children with disabilities within Syria. Uh, and uh, we we work with this organization to make sure that we are in alignment. If there is any kind of referral, we do. So we do case management, we do referrals, even not only with for children with, with disabilities, but also for like a wider inclusive program, also for children with like having trauma or having any um, emotional distress, etc. So uh, mainly uh, we make sure that we have this kind of routine meetings. We make sure that we, we are trying not to duplicate the resources. And uh, usually this is the main way in terms of running our activities or making sure that we have an established connection with everyone or stakeholders. I hope I heard the question correctly, but unfortunately the sound when coming from the room is a little bit uh, not clear. Just to clarify, was it, it? I think the question was engaging with other organisations, but also specific planning for and support of disabled children. Is that is that right? So maybe let's pass over to Chantal and just ask how are you how are you helping school leadership to do that? Thank you very much for the question. Um, uh, we, as I presented, uh, school leaders are. Uh, considered as uh, gatekeepers of anything that happens at school level. So there is nothing much that can happen at school level when school leaders are not really involved. So whatever we do at, uh, in Rwanda, in Vietnam, in South Africa and other countries for teachers, any intervention uh, capacity development for, for teachers, we make sure that we engage teachers, we train them, uh, on that specific content, but on top of that, we also add uh, training on effective school leadership to make sure that they are also uh, managing the resources toward um, for effective teaching and learning. So, so that's what we do, and um, uh, in, in specifically in Rwanda, we, we are really targeting directly school leaders, and it's a more comprehensive. Uh, CPD or training program uh, which focuses on, on making sure that they are performing against the standards because in Rwanda we have standards for effective school leadership, uh, they are five and, and we make sure that we train them to, to perform against uh, those standards and inclusion is a cross-cutting issue in all these um, uh, standards that I have for, um, listed. I don't know if I have answered the question. Thank you. Is there anything that you would add there? Yeah, I'm not sure we, we've touched as directly on your question about safeguarding and particularly how to ensure um, those with disabilities, particularly non-physical or less visible disabilities, um, psychological disabilities are, are able to report. And I think that's a really, it's a really important question. As with any good practice on safeguarding, I think you know our focus in Syria has not just been putting um, you know, complaints boxes or reporting boxes in schools um, and setting up WhatsApp numbers. It's been coming up with as many different ways that reporting can take place um, and as many avenues to speak up as we have. And I think a particular piece that we put into schools um, has been the safeguarding officer whose sole responsibility day in and day out is attending to socializing um, concepts of safeguarding, engaging with teachers, visiting classrooms, keeping an eye on some of the most vulnerable students and engaging with the communities because I think one of the powerful things we've seen in particular as we engage with communities who at first were mystified and then suspicious is now a highly supportive 
community that is coming in and talking either to the safeguarding committee or coming into the safeguarding officer and talking about changes in behavior they might see in their child. Why is that happening? Um, things that they're understanding might be happening. We've got someone in the school who is not responsible right now for a classroom, but who's solely responsible for keeping an eye on what's going on. And that's true as well for those who have more profound disabilities who are not in the mainstream classroom or in um, the, disability, the, the uh, inclusion centers for children with disabilities that Abdul Qadr spoke with. Also, those have a safeguarding officer whose sole um, purpose is really to keep an eye on these things. And I think the last piece I'll say too is just engaging with the children. Safeguarding is not something that's a system that we've come in and implemented from outside. We've engaged the community, but we've also very actively engaged the children in informing them of their rights and talking to them about what are the different ways that you can speak up? What are other ways you would like to see us open for you to be able to speak up and to engage? And a lot of that's been facilitated with the safeguarding officer um, so that we have individuals within the school who are known to be safe focal points that can discuss with students and can adapt the processes. We've, we've made a lot of modifications based on the many, many suggestions that we've gotten over time from students as we've been engaging them. Thank you. I think we had another question here. Uh, my name is Moshe. And second one is how uh, what was how difficult it is to use that question. And third question is where people with disabilities or organizations of people with disabilities engage in that process because we need to think about human centered designing process so that disabled people's participation is not nice but essential to have. Uh, very effective program on the ground. Let me just summarise those questions in case Abdul Khalid couldn't hear those. I think the question was um, asked, when you used the Washington tool, which questions did you use? How difficult did you find them? And how did you ensure people's engagement with that process? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for repeating the question because it was on uh, uh, the mic was on mute, so I did not hear it from the beginning. So um, thank you for this question. Um, the, uh, we use the, uh, the Washington, uh, so we use the international tool, the Washington Group Child Functioning Screening. Um, I think that the, the challenge was as a start, as I mentioned, like in earlier days in Syria, it was not so children with disabilities were not even included in the education system. They have their own system isolated in uh, within a, uh, another minister, ministry. So they were not included within the education system. So the first challenge was to train teachers on using the tool uh, to help them identify. So we started with the uh, with a simple tool that is used by the teacher, by the teachers. Um, I think as a start after uh, many sessions of trainings, there were some gaps in terms of how the teachers were able to fill it. So we used uh, then a combined uh, tool to make sure that both teachers and parents are filling uh, the tool, uh, two, two separate tools. Uh, I think answering the question specifically because some questions are uh, meant for some uh, children at really early grades. So it was hard to tell without asking their parents. So it was a combination. I, I think we piloted in 2000. Uh, 18. Uh, the, the percentage of children with disabilities at that time was really high, 
because for misuse of the tool. But then after like learning from how we implemented the tool, we were able to uh, modify the questions, contextualize it in the Arabic language with um, like very well known Syrian words, for example, to parents and to, to children, and then it the process was easier. Now it's really well implemented within the uh, teaching system in Northwest Syria. So at, at first it was really difficult. We faced a lot of difficulties, but we learned from the process. Thank you, thank you so much. I think we've got a question at the back. Yeah. Might have to start up. Can you hear me okay? Um, I, I can hear, can I just check? Can, can, you, can you hear the mic, Chantelle and Abt? Can you, can, could you speak again and just check? It's being it we can hear the echo from the room uh, yes. that you hear. So we, that we cannot hear the mic directly. That's why it's not clear. If you ask a question, I'll try and summarise. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I'm Julia and Karen, and we're head of inclusive education, humanity and inclusion. So the S4 very much uh, interesting to me. I'm a bit like the other ladies, saying it's lots of questions, but I'll try to pick two short ones. One, I was very interested in the EGRA study. Um, I'm particularly interested when your last sentence, I think, you mentioned about um, uh, maybe mod some modifications to children who may use Braille or perhaps children with hearing impairment. So I was wondering if you could maybe Go in a bit more detail about that. We tried to um, modify EGRA for uh, children who, who use sign language and children who use Braille in the pool a while back. So I just wanted to know a bit more about your insight. It would be interesting to hear about. And um, I, think I was also interested about the Syria program. You mentioned earlier um, that some children with uh, more, more severe disabilities were in the special centres. So I was just interested um, how much inclusion there were with those children and the mainstream children in there because obviously it's not ideal to keep them segregated, but I understand that they might have higher needs. So it's, it's those two questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, Martin, should we take the first? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not going to give you a very clear answer, I'm afraid. Um, I'd love to be able to say I know exactly what was done. Um, a couple of things. Firstly, um, during the training, the teachers were advised, um, and remembering we're now talking about every early grade teacher in the country um, because they're class teachers. So basically every grade one, two and three teachers is trained. Um, during that training, we advised them to um, look and identify, they should know already, but to identify within the class um, learners with particular impairment or difficulties or challenges and then cater for them as far as possible within the class con context. Um, what that meant to a large extent was that because um, the, the um, uh, examples and so on were put on the board, um, was that the learners who had any form of um, sight impairment and hearing impairment were then moved to the front. Um, just very, very simple. As simple as that. Uh, what we did see and what we encouraged was that where there were um, psychosocial and other forms of challenges that the learners might have, that the teachers themselves took that into account when they were doing the testing. Um, what that often meant was bringing in another teacher um, during the testing um, or the assessment process so that um, individual learners could have someone, and I know there were some instances where, um, and I'm thinking of a Catholic school particularly, um, the picture I've got is of a nun sitting with the learner um, and um, basically assisting the learner fill in the basic, on the basis the learner could read, but the problem was obviously with writing. Um, and so the teacher was, at the, sorry, the, the helper, in this case the nun was able to fill in and so we actually had some, or the, the school had some sense of the reading ability of that learner. I'm sorry, I, I haven't got more than that. Super, thank you, Martin. So the second question, Abdul Khan, I'll, I'll hand over to you, which was about where we do have children on the Syria Education Programme who are um, supported in, um, in specialist um, centres. How much uh, integration is there? Yeah, thank you. Um, the special education centers to clarify here, so it's uh, mainly resource room within the schools. So we're talking about children with severe disabilities or that will need special attention. 
Uh, so within these 34 special education centers, we have only 250 uh, children. So we're talking about um, eight children per class. Uh, however, we have started to test recently and we pilot this in the last academic year that um, at least each child will need to attend um, uh, the other like uh, with other peers with uh, in the same age in the same age group. Uh, so they will go and attend another classroom for at least once a week. So we uh, even uh, and for children with moderate disabilities, uh, they are usually included within uh, the normal classroom setting, but with alternative education plans. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chantal, I'm going to steal your thunder for a moment. Um, in, in South Africa, um, I led a team that evaluated BBOB's inclusion program. Um, and what was happening there, was, I found really interesting in KwaZulu-Natal particularly. Um, they had um, learner support assistants who are government employed. Um, the learner support assistant sits in the class with the learner, um, with collaborating with the teacher, then decides at what point they're going to take those learners out. They take them into a safe space, um, which has been set aside. Um, with color coordinated computers um, generally so that they've got an ability to um, help the learners um, begin to decode because um, and we're now talking about grade three learners. So they are learners who have basically been passed over. They've got to grade three and still not able to decode. They take them out of that context, out of the class and spend the lesson with them on the bay on working on a program that the LSA and the teacher have mm -hmm. collaborated on. And then they work through that, and then the child goes back into the classroom for the next lesson. I can't see if we've got any questions online. Thank you, Martin. I think it's, it's not a question, but a comment, right? Yeah, it was just a comment I was making. Thank you. Go ahead, go ahead everybody uh, we've had some online questions so i'll just gonna read one out from my end uh, to say the project in syria is crucial for ensuring inclusion particularly because vulnerable and disabled children are at risk of being adversely affected by any project closure or discontinuation how does the project plan to secure the sustainability and maintain inclusive support do you, do you want to take that one absolutely and Abdul Qadir, the question was around the, the criticality of support to education. Are you hearing me out? Yeah, I can hear you. And since it's an online question, I have read that question, so I can oh. go directly <laughs> and answer. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a very yeah, it's a very good question actually, because one of the main component is, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my in my talking point, uh, my my earlier presentation was uh, system strengthening. So by system strengthening, we mean that we are trying to establish systems that will last beyond the project lifetime. So this is as a first. So when we're talking about an inclusive education, we set up, uh, we support the education directorates and the education assemblies, which are relatively new uh, in the area because they are now run by the uh, the Syrian interim government, which is which runs the uh, opposition controlled area. So here we're talking about setting policies uh, and uh, building a system, building associations which also engage community stakeholders. So uh, for example, the parents of teachers with disabilities association, which was established two years ago, which was something new that they can advocate and speak in on behalf of children with disabilities. We believe this kind of intervention uh, will last because when these associations are now started, they're now even imported and uh, included within the uh, decision making process. The, the, for example, the parents of children with disabilities are now attending the uh, policy session uh, at the beginning of each academic year, academic year with the education directorates, etc. So here, the sustainability is more focused on the system, on making sure there are policies. We have created some policies for, for example, safeguarding um, policy, uh, inclusion policy, etc. 
Um, in, in addition to that, of course, this will be also need to be maintained through financial support, um, which was also, uh, uh, for example, there was another commitment from the uh, FCDO for another four years project uh, that uh, uh, th that will start soon uh, as a follow on to the current Syria Education Project and will be named Syria Education Project 2. So it's a combination of both, but hopefully the sustainability on the system level will will last uh, even beyond any project lifetime. Thank you. Can I add one point? OK, very quickly. Yeah, I'll, I'll be really quick. I'll, I'll just pick up on this because I think it's a trend we see in fragile and conflict affected environments. I think another piece we've been very active along with FCDO also is advocating in this environment that the funding that's coming in through the humanitarian funding streams can and should be going into the formal education system for exactly the reasons that Abdul Qadr is mentioning, which is we have a functioning education system and we want to be building that capacity as opposed to what the natural inclination often is, which is to be doing education activities in the non-formal sector. And so that's been a really critical piece because if we can tap into, coordinate and align the resources from the donor community into the formal system, we're going to have a much greater long-term impact in terms of the sustainability and also a much greater capability to sustain the, the formal system. So that's been a critical piece more on the advocacy than on the program delivery side, but one that we've been very focused on. Thanks. That was great. Thank you, Liz. Uh, next question. We'll have another online one quickly at this one and then we'll see if we can squeeze another in the room one. So another online question. Um, do you have any experience on engaging the learners themselves as young people in the safeguarding world because they've led it? Absolutely. I can start maybe then Abt can add some examples. I think that's been a critical piece when we were first engaging um, on safeguarding back in 2018 when we were starting up the program in Syria. We first went to the students to define for them what are your rights in Syria at that point corporal punishment was legal there was no con it was condoned in schools it was socially accepted um, and so we were going up against very deeply entrenched cultural norms so first we went to the students to define your rights and really work through a whole kind of unit or module on that and then come as students have engaged with understanding their rights and the responsibilities of the school and of the adults surrounding them, uh, you know, what are the safeguarding mechanisms? What are the reporting mechanisms that we would like to see? And we did a lot of work with students. This is early primary school that was done through pictures, through small group work, and really facilitating them through those dialogues. And then took that upward at the same time that we were working with the EDs coming downward from the policy level in terms of showing them codes of conduct, discussing, you know, global expectations um, for safeguarding within schools. So it was a critical piece and I think it's central to helping children be empowered, not just safeguarded, but also be empowered and know that their voice matters and engaged with their education, which is important for many reasons, not least of which is also feeling empowered to report later in the process. And I don't know if I missed anything, or if you can hear any of no, no, you did not miss anything, but just to build on what you have mentioned Liz, really quickly is I think a critical piece was on presenting materials, brochures, etc. Uh, for example, in our project in a very child friendly uh, way. So, for example, in the safeguarding the most important, not having a complaints book, but uh, a complaints box, sorry, but it's how to report it. So they need to know exactly children will need to be included in the safeguarding process. No who to report to, how to report, how it's going to be uh, stay anonymous, how gonna we make sure that it's going to be safe reporting mechanism. So we have a presented of a lot of child friendly materials uh, in a very basic way. Uh, also, we have introduced uh, weekly sessions in terms of uh, uh, the code of conduct um, and how to present the code of conduct for children so they can understand exactly what are their rights, how to report, when to report, whom to report to, etc. Uh, but just like I wanted to add to what you have provided Liz in, in, in terms of an actual example within the project. Thank you. 
Do we have any more questions in the room? Yes. Lady in the black and white. This is just a short question for Chantelle. So I was interested, you were talking about um, the way that you um, were promoting gender equality so with gender transformative education. And I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about that, what you did, uh, whether boys and girls were both included in that, and whether there are any evaluations and kind of outcome assessments of that. Did you hear that question, Chantelle? Sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Alison Bodie from Triple Line. Thank you, Alison. You're on mute, Chantel. Okay. Um, I think if I heard the question, uh, it's about the gender um, transformative pedagogy um resource toolkit that we have in south africa is it that the, that is it the question that's right and also whether but how did you and um, how did you approach that were boys and girls involved in that it would be great to just outline and um, the key principles um so video bay together with partners including fawe uh developed this toolkit the toolkit on gender transformative pedagogy in ECE. And this um, has been, been used, used in South Africa um, and it has a component of school leaders, uh, school leadership uh, um, training to provide them with, the, with the, uh, the tools and the competences to, to be able to promote gender equality for, for these young children. Um, at school level and to prevent gender-based violence. So this this uh, toolkit has been adapted in South Africa by the government department and is still being used at scale. Um, yeah, in in a, a tailored way. So it's it's a it's a toolkit which is uh, available, which is uh, online and a free uh, resource accessible uh, material to do this. Yeah. Thank you. Another question here, please. So it's the lady in the multiple address gap. Um, thank you very much. My name is Emmy van Hogger. I'm from Batalia in the Netherlands. And I have a question for Professor here. Um, our company is actually built on the fact that we believe that children should be taught in their native language, first of all. What's your opinion about that? We do AI approaches to native languages, and especially for Africa, but what is your opinion about that? Is it just lack of resources that makes uh, colonial languages the language to go to? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, when we started working on this project, we had our first data. It was very clear that the contrast between performance in the regional languages versus performance in English was so different in that reading comprehension in English was around 10% uh, and reading comprehension in Hindi or Telugu was around 60 or 70%, right? So uh, obviously the answer is start with the language that the child knows. Um, we are looking at children who are not in the first year of primary school, so they are in year four or five, uh, and secondary education is in English in the majority of, of places, in, of government schools in India. Um, the parents, uh, the public generally would like English to remain. So every time I was presenting, you know, the mother tongue education, even though it is part of the national education policy as well, it's restricted to early school years. Uh, regardless, many state governments have opted for English as a minimum instruction. So what we are trying to, so what we have understood is that going for mother tongue education throughout primary school or even further is actually something that is not going to be endorsed 
either by the parents or by you know policy. So what we're trying, and we do appreciate the reason why English is so sought after. I mean, it's all over the world, not just in India. Um, but what we are trying to do is build on the resources that are already available because these people are very good language learners, um, and they are unusually good because they, you know, the average adult Indian might speak four or five languages. And this is something that doesn't, <clears throat> as I said, translate into the literacy skills, but it, it does. They do have that because there is so much linguistic diversity. So I definitely agree with you that we should start with mother tongue education. But in case this is not possible, at least what we can do is have multilingual resources for these children so that English or whatever other language which is not, you know, the language that they speak at home or that is supported outside of school um, is used uh, for, for better understanding, better development. One thing I wanted to say is that in India and in other multilingual societies, oral communication involves a lot of language mixing, a lot of code switching, and that's the natural way. I mean, some researchers have called it dense code switching, it doesn't matter what you call it. The point is that you may have in the same sentence elements from more than one language. And I think this is something that children grow up to do as well. So it's not just the adults that do it. Um, and I think that's the natural way of not only using the languages they know, but also learning a new language. So it's actually embedded into languages. You know, the new parts of the language are embedded into uh, familiar languages. So what we are trying to do, and I didn't have time to talk about, is that we encourage that language mixing, um, which is the natural way of uh, communicating, and we use English as the embedded language there. I think it's one more question. Did, did you have a, yeah, did you have a question? Uh, you mentioned about... So could you introduce... Uh, and nodding um, because it has been such a significant challenge through the life of the program and, and probably one of the accomplishments that we're most proud of has been the ability to navigate the change of control of the area in which we're delivering the Syria education program um, predominantly into the hands of a, a you know different points in time as ebbed and flowed but a, a designated terrorist organization. I think the points I made around safeguarding the criticality of relying on known and existing systems and processes and engaging the community. Those two principles may help safeguarding, but they've been absolutely critical for maintaining the operating space in which we're operating, which is to bring the community along to see the benefits of the interventions, the benefits of their children having better trained teachers, of schools being safe spaces, and that incentive um, that comes with seeing the package not being something that is foreign and scary, but indeed something that is, you know, causing their children to have a better experience at school and to be showing learning gains. Um, and it's constant, continual communication. We also did bed everything within the system, and that was the familiar educational system to anyone throughout Syria. We tried not to break away from the established system that prior to um, the, the conflict existed and is familiar to people. Uh, regardless of where they grew up in the country, regardless of their religious background. It was a familiar standardized education system. And so I think that also has helped. That, though, is my perspective from the outside. So, Abdul Qadr, I don't know that you heard this question, but it would be important to hear from you about how we've managed to navigate the operational complexities 
um, of delivering education um, uh, in, in the HTS controlled areas um, and with the strong HTS influence in, in the areas we work. Yeah, th thank you, Liz, for repeating the question as well. I think this is a, like this is by itself is a full session, <laughs> so I cannot really have. But like to summarize is um, usually this is our daily work when when we work in an area where we know that the Syrian interim government is the one responsible for education formally. However, there is the HTS, the Hayat Tahrir uh, al-Sham government that is uh, called the Syrian Salvation Government, which try to control education, which try to take over education and claim um, the, uh, the success that the education has established. So uh, the risk mitigation and the risk management is one of the daily work that we do every every day. So we have a lot of our risk matrix is really, really complex. Uh, we have a lot of scenarios. We have a lot of uh, previous uh, trial to intervene within the project, uh, try to take credit, for example. But uh, we have a mitigation process for uh, every single anticipated action or unanticipated action. But directly, mainly, uh, for example, financial management uh, in an area that, that have also um, presence of HTS in the area also was another challenge, but we have a very long and complicated delivery chain, verification process, monitoring process, 100% of monitoring of financial records, spot uh, spot checks on, on financial management. So we have a lot of risk, fiduciary risk, uh, reputational risk, but I think uh, in general, if we're gonna talk about bringing an experience to another context, I think a good risk mitigation plan and the risk, a good uh, uh, risk matrix that can respond to any potentiality or like likelihood of any kind of risk, I think would be a solution. And of course, will be an engagement with the client, with the donor, as well, uh, continuous engagement, um, making sure that uh, everything is communicated in time, discussed, uh, I think is also another key on how to implement it. But as I said, this is can be a full session that can last for two hours. But uh, if anyone is interested, I'm happy to be uh, connected directly and we can discuss this in a length. Thank you so much. Nicola. We are running out of time. I just wanted to leave with one thought um, for anyone who wants to take it up on the panel. What lessons, we talked a lot about some specific concepts, but what lessons would you take from what you know and apply to higher income countries to further their approach to inclusive education? Anyone want to open up? Yeah, yeah. Just say, I yeah. mean, illiteracy and reading comprehension is a problem in this country mm -hmm. as well. So it's not it's not just, you know, India. In fact, um, I think it's quite the uh, an important problem and, and, and crucially it doesn't affect only EAL children. So it's not just about English as an additional language. It's, it's also for monolingual children. So um, the, the question of how to help uh, in, in, in this context and what we need to improve is a, is a question that we need to address in the UK and in the global north more generally. And as far as I know, uh, we know about uh, pieces of the puzzle of what leads to good reading comprehension, but we don't have a concrete answer that would put everything together. So oral skills um, are important, critical learning is important, but somebody needs, like the school, needs to uh, teach you strategies of how to approach things, how to think more about what you read and so on. And I think there are many ways in which this can be addressed, but it's not, it's, it's a question of uh, socioeconomic status as well. And I think there is, unfortunately, this link between better literacy skills in, in children from, you know, more advantaged, you know, backgrounds. Um, but I think this is a question that cuts across um, children with uh, learning difficulties. Uh, monolingual, bilingual, multilingual children from any part of the world. So I think obviously, you know, some of the things, at least, I mean, from my expertise, some of the things that we talked about uh, would be relevant to, to this country as well. 
Nancy, any other thoughts before we close out? I'll just underline I think you know, the principles of engagement. There's much more uh, established, I think, in much of the global north mechanisms for the engagement of families and communities. Um, but I think in many cases, um, and I come from from having children in the US system, um, at least for us, these have become highly political and quite detached from what the child's interest and learning outcomes are. And so getting back to the basics of what does good engagement with families and communities look like if it can't exist, you know, in certain cases through existing structures that have been politicized, how do you re energize through different types of organizations that engagement? Um, and I think that's particularly important around issues of of inclusion and special needs and you know pulling on what Abdul Qadir had said in Syria, the experience of having a grouping of parents of children who do have disabilities who come together and are capable of advocating and engaging and supporting the school system in meeting their children's needs is something I know at least in my children's school is much needed and could be adapted from Syria. Um, on that note, I just want to thank my panel for all of your um, inspiring and thoughtful comments and very much a thanks to the questions which were very thought provoking for those people who joined online. We are running a series of events and um, so please keep on top of our Monarchs UK um, website LinkedIn page and um, we will give notice of the next events coming up. Um, thank you so much. Bye bye.